All right. Good morning, everyone. Oh, well. Here we are with uh, Ocean Geographic Live with Dr. Mark Ehrman, and I'm in Sydney, Australia. Mark is in uh, New Zealand, mm -hmm. and again, we have Alex Rose in Chicago. Okay, this morning's oh, wow. session, Mark, I met Mark sometime in the 90s, and I, I think it was, wasn't that during an expedition with uh, Carden Wallace to the... Yes, yeah. yeah, that was quite an, quite an expedition in those days, and then Mark was very instrumental in setting up the North Slovakia Sea Sport Diving Association, which uh, was very uh, a unique force to get the management of that Bunakan Marine Park in place. Mm -hmm. So, Alex, over you go. Okay. I get to do the obligatory biography reading, so sit tight. Okay. In case you wanted to hear about yourself, Mark, we've got you covered. <laughs> Okay, so for anyone who doesn't know about Dr. Mark Erdman, um, he's the Vice President of Asia Pacific Marine Programs for Conservation International, with a primary focus on providing strategic guidance and technical and fundraising support to CI's marine programs in the Asia Pacific region, especially West Papua. Mark is a coral reef ecologist with a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, who lived and worked for 23 years in Indonesia and is now based in New Zealand. During this time, he's logged over 12,000 dives while surveying marine biodiversity throughout the region and has now described 162 new species of fish, mantis shrimp, and corals. He's published 205 scientific articles and five books, including most recently the three-volume set, Reef Fishes of the East Indies, with colleague Dr. Jerry Allen. Mark was awarded a Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation in 2004 for his work in marine conservation education and training for Indonesian school children, members of the press, and the law enforcement community. Though his work is now largely focused on the management of marine protected areas, his continuing research interests include reef fish and mantis shrimp biodiversity, genetic connectivity and MPA networks, and elasmobron conservation and he maintains a research association associate position with the California Academy of Sciences and advises several PhD and master's students at the University of Auckland. He's also active on the boards of a number of local NGOs within the Coral Triangle, including Indonesian Ocean Pride, Thrive Conservation, and Reef Check Indonesia. Oof. So if anyone thought they were doing a lot, you're probably not doing that much. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much for being with us, Mark. And um, I have to say right off the bat, I'm extremely jealous that you've gotten to uh, have, have your name on papers with Roy Caldwell, who is my stomatopod hero, of course. Oh. So it's pretty fantastic. I'll, I'll have to ask you about that later. But thanks for making the time to be with us tonight. Thank you, Mark. Okay. All right. There you go. All right. All right your turn. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, I think that uh, what you all have asked me to do is to, to start off by um, sharing a, a bit about uh, some of the new species finds um, over the past 20 years or so, um, most of which have been done uh, in close association with my colleague, Jerry Allen, um, as well as with a number of Indonesian colleagues. So I am gonna try to share my screen right now and make that happen. Um, and Perfect. Perfect. Okay, I think we're good. So this is a bit about the new species finds in the bird's head seascape, um, which I'll explain what that means here in just a second. Um, there you can see a map, of course, of uh, uh, the Indonesian archipelago, um, uh, right there in between the Pacific and Indian Oceans, and the area that I'm going to be talking about specifically uh, with respect to these new species finds is what we call the bird's head seascape. Um, and that area is also known, uh, perhaps uh, in governmental speak, as West Papua province uh, in Indonesia. It's, it's a very lightly populated area, um, and it's about the size of peninsular Malaysia, 225,000 square kilometers. Um, and it has three main regions for diving exploration, which of course many people will be familiar with, uh, especially Raja Ampat, um, but also Tuluk Chandrawasi and the Fak Fak Kaimana coastline where you have Triton Bay. And, I'll just quickly note, people frequently say bird's head, bird's head seascape, what does that mean? Well, you can imagine that uh, back in the 1800s, the Dutch and German cartographers of the, the era recognized that this looked like a bird, and so they named it the Vogelkop, uh, which is Kapala Burung in Indonesian, and the decidedly less sexy bird's head in English, but uh, we go with it because that is what it is frequently referred to in biogeography. Um, now, the areas that I just referred to, Raja Ampat, of course, that's a, an area of about 700 islands in the far northwestern corner 
um, probably the crown jewel of the bird's head in West Papuan diving. Um, many might have also heard of Tuluk Chandrawasi, Chandrawasi Bay. Um, this is where uh, lots of people are familiar with the whale sharks there. Um, and then beyond that, we also have the Fak Fak and Kaimana coastline. So those are kind of the three main regions, and uh, I thought it was important to kind of show those to you before I get into talking about some of the new species. So uh, again, this area um, we refer to as the global epicenter of marine biodiversity. Um, and we say that because this region has over 600 species of hard coral, um, which is roughly 75% of the total number of hard coral species on the planet. Um, it, it's more than 10 times what you have in the entire Caribbean Sea uh, in a very small, much smaller area. And at least 20 of those are endemic or only found in, uh, in West Papua. Um, if I look at the reef fishes, which is more my expertise, um, our current count is up to 1,862 species of coral reef fish, 53 of which are only found in West Papua. Um, and again, to put that into perspective, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, which is roughly 10 times the size of the area we're talking about here, only has about 1,550 species. So um, this is really an amazing place in terms of the number of species that you can find. And we frequently refer to it as a species factory or a cauldron of evolution. And uh, I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, this area also has the largest Pacific leatherback turtle rookery in the world, the nesting beaches on the, the north of the bird's head, um, and globally outstanding megafauna populations. We have 17 species of marine mammal, uh, ranging from blue whales and orcas uh, to lots of sperm whales and a whole range of others, dugongs, of course, whale sharks, both species of manta ray uh, found in abundance, um, three different species of wobegong, and five different species of walking shark, which I'll talk a bit about more. So let's get into some of the new species. Um, this was one of the first that I was involved with uh, when I first really started working with Jerry Allen in West Papua. Um, this was uh, from a survey that we were doing for the uh, Tuluk Chandrawasi National Park um, to, to, to really look at the biodiversity of the area, which was not that well known at the time that we did this in 2006. And this is a fairy wrasse, a beautiful animal that we ended up naming uh, Cyrilabras chandrawasi after the, the bay where it's found. Um, and I thought I'd just point out you know, when we go looking for new species or when we're documenting what's there, um, you know, the, the important thing is to be able to, you have to know the known species in order to recognize when you have an unknown one. And frequently those unknown ones are not necessarily so starkly different that they just stand out like a blinking light. Um, they're frequently quite slight variations on a theme. And so this is a good example. You can see in the upper left corner there, Cyrilabris wulindi, uh, which Jerry Allen described with the late uh, Jack, Dr. Jack Randall in 1996 from New Britain in Papua New Guinea. And you can see the Cyrilabris chandrawasi looks quite similar to it, um, but there are some distinct differences, including that yellow stripe down the side, as well as the larger number of uh, black blotches under the dorsal fin. Um, so we immediately recognized that as being something probably quite different and new, um, and we were able to collect and describe that. Um, and I'll, I'll note that frequently when we do name new species, um, we try to do that in a way which brings local pride. Um, and in this particular case, again, naming it after Chandrawasi Bay, which was not really very well known at the time, um, had a great impact. And the, the head of the National Park uh, to this day still has this poster on right behind his, his desk. And uh, I would note that when we did this, it also brought a lot of attention to Chandrawasi Bay um, and the, the actual governmental budget for the, for the park um, quadrupled the next year uh, after this. And of course, finding the whale sharks helped as well. Um, here's another one, uh, a beautiful little dotty back, uh, pink or purple and, and, and uh, yellow. And this is another one where it's an interesting little variation on a theme. So if you look at the, the species in the bottom right corner, Pictochromus orifrons, that's known uh, really only from around Port Moresby, uh, Bootless Bay in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. Um, and we knew of that species, but as you can see, it's a little bit different uh, in Chandrawasi Bay. Um, a little bit brighter, uh, the yellow stripe penetrates further back and even onto the tail. And so we just, we suspected this was new, but we actually had to go and um, be able to take genetic samples of both to be able to prove that. But what's kind of cool about Chandrawasi Bay is that over the years, and in particular during that 2006 survey, we found, uh, I think it's now 20 different pairs of species like this 
um, where it turns out that the one that's living in Chenderwasi Bay looks a bit different or, or even a fair bit different, um, and it turns out to be a new species. Um, and that tells us something really interesting because you don't really expect to find what we call endemics in the marine realm on, on such a regular basis. But the fact that we had 20 of these in Chenderwasi Bay told us something interesting is going on there. Um, and I'll just show this. Um, so this is again a, a picture of Chenderwasi Bay. And as you're probably aware, you know, over the, the course of the last millions of years, sea level has, has risen and fallen repeatedly. Um, and uh, additionally, we have tectonic movements. So we get these long islands like Yapin there uh, at the top of the, the, the page, um, which are moving across on, on a geological time frame. They move across the mouth of the bay. And so what we have is basically this open closing of the shutter, uh, which blocks off Chenderwasi Bay repeatedly over the last 10, 12 million years. And during those periods of blockage where it's completely closed off, um, it's basically its own little evolutionary cauldron, and that's allowed this really tremendous uh, uh, number of new species to, to show up there, uh, to evolve there, I should say. So that's pretty cool. Um, this is another one of our Chenderwasi Bay finds. This is a walking shark, um, Hemicillium gali. And I'll note that this is kind of an interesting one. We had been on that survey for about two weeks, uh, doing four or five dives a day. Uh, pretty tired. We never really had time for a, a night dive. And uh, my colleague, Jerry Allen, hates night dives anyway. Um, but I really wanted to see what we could, what we could see. So about the, the two-week mark, we, we went for a night dive. I did this with my colleagues from the State University of Papua. And we found this shark. And it immediately looked to me, okay, clearly it's one of the walking sharks. But it looks different than the one that we knew from, from, uh, from Rajampat. So uh, my colleagues from State University of Papua and I captured this shark. Uh, by hand, it's pretty easy to do. And we brought it back to the ship, to the sleeping Jerry Allen, and uh, I woke him up. That was a bad idea. Um, he, he kind of gruffly yelled at me through his door, and I said, oh, we've got this really cool shark. I think it's different. And he said, ah, oh, fuck off. Go somewhere else. And uh, sorry, that's probably not, not appropriate on the live stream. At any rate, but that was what he said. Uh, so, um, I said, no, really, I think it's, I think it's different. And uh, he insisted that, it, that I should just bugger off and be done with it. So we actually kept the, the shark in a, in a tub overnight. And the next morning when he woke up in a much better mood, um, he was like, oh yeah, pretty interesting. So we, we, we took the shark underwater and took these photographs. And at the end of the dive, I signaled to him, so is this potentially something different that we should be taking a, a fin clip for genetic uh, differences or, or something? And he goes, no, 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 just let it go. So I let it go. And as soon as we were back on the boat and he downloaded his images and he compared them, uh, that's a comparison. You can see the, the Rajampat shark down below and there's the, the Emerson Gelai Chandrawasi in the top left. And you can see there are some differences there. There's a lot more smaller spots on the, uh, the, the, the one from Rajampat um, and a difference to the epaulette. Uh, and, and sure enough, he's like, gosh darn it, it's a new species. Why didn't we keep that thing? So. Classic Jerry Allen, I have so many of those stories that it, it bores me now. Um, I should also note that uh, a couple of months later, we went to Triton Bay, and uh, there we found yet another new species of walking shark. This one um, named after my good friend and associate, uh, Wilcott Henry, um, who's been a, a real tremendous supporter of conservation in the bird's head over the past uh, two decades. Uh, anyway, so you can see that one's a little bit different. Maybe it doesn't look different, but again, that subtle variation in theme, if you look at the differences in the epaulets, you can see that um, you know, the Chenderwasi one is, is quite distinctly different actually from, from the, uh, the uh, one in Triton Bay named after Wolcott. Um, and I would note, actually, we just recently published uh, the walking sharks actually represent the most recent evolutionary radiation of any shark known. So um, most shark species have been around for tens, if not uh, 100 million years or more. Um, and in the case of these animals, they only branched out and became different species two to three million years ago in, uh, in West Papua. So they're evolutionarily very young, the walking sharks, um, cool animals. Uh, this is another one we found in Chenderwasi Bay. It's a deep water uh, damselfish, uh, typically below 65 meters. Um, and that one we named after the State University of Papua. Uh, as they were important people on the on the uh, survey. And uh, this is one which I'd again note by naming it after the State University of Papua, uh, the rector of the university became very pleased with this. And the next day he announced a scholarship program for native Papuans in marine biology. So um, 
sometimes naming new species can really uh, get you somewhere, which I'm always happy to see. Um, now I'm going to shoot across down to Triton Bay uh, and, and Fak Fak and Kaimana coastline. Uh, so we, we did an, another set of surveys there um, with the uh, Papuan Department of, of Conservation in 2006. And this is one of the first new species we found. This is a, a flasher wrasse, a gorgeous animal. Um, and I think one of the things, besides the fact that it's really beautiful, and I like to show this, this is Jerry Allen's photo, um, is the fact that when we found it, the first dive we found it, uh, Jerry managed to flood his camera before he could get a photo of it. Um, and, and you can imagine he was beside himself with unhappiness. Um, we actually managed to have a new camera sent in and it arrived about 10 days later uh, into Kaimana. We were able to get it. And so he finally was able to flash this, uh, this shot of the flash arrest before, before the end of the survey, which made him happy. Beautiful animal though, and you find that, you can get it actually in southern Rajampat, uh, Misol, on down to Fak Fak and Kaimana. This is another one we found on that survey, uh, which is named Mananikthes Jamali. Uh, it's a dotty back, uh, named after uh, one of the crew members on the vessel who tragically uh, had an, an engine accident, electrical accident uh, at the end of the trip and, and passed away. Um, so we named it after him. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous little dotty back, only found again from really south misol into Fak Fak and Kaimana. What's interesting about this one is that it mimics a very well-known damselfish uh, that you might have seen before. Um, I, Jerry and I have been trying for over 10 years now to get the, the perfect shot of the, the dotty back living amongst the, the, uh, uh, the damsels it's mimicking and have not yet gotten that shot. But it's, it's basically, it's a nasty piscivore. And so it, it gets in there with the, the, uh, the damselfish and then it eats the babies, <laughs> um, which is classic kind of situation with coral reef fishes. But. Uh, this is another one, uh, which is from that region. Actually, this is uh, Hopolatilus randalli, named after um, the late uh, Dr. Jack Randall, um, probably the most, not probably, definitely the most productive ichthyologist of the past century. Um, Jack sadly just passed away last week, actually, at the age of 95, um, after having described over 830 species of fish in his career, which is quite spectacular. Um, this is a tile fish. It's typically found below 45 meters, between 45 and 70. Uh, so it's not one which is normally seen by recreational divers, but it builds these huge mounds of rubble. Um, and uh, it's actually found, we described it from Rajampat, um, but, but it's found all the way from the Philippines uh, to um, Palau and, and even to the Solomon Islands and certainly across eastern Indonesia. But the reason I threw this up there, besides I wanted to simply uh, make that little tribute to, to Jack, um, is that it also tied into something interesting we found on that same Fak Fak Kaimana survey. So you can imagine I was uh, doing a lot of deep diving at that time and I was down at 70 meters and I see this one down in the bottom right corner there which you can see, which looks very similar in a lot of ways, but it has this very distinctive tiger striping on it. Um, so with that one, I, I, I tried my utmost to get a, a photo of it, but at the time I was using kind of a, a Canon power shot and an Icolite housing and it, it jammed up at 70 meters. The pressure was just too great and I wasn't able to get the photo. So I, after a long decompression, I got back up on the ship and I explained to Jerry, I'd found this beautiful tilefish with tiger stripes. And he just looked at me and he said, ah, that's called narcosis, mate. And I'm like, no, 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 really, it had tiger stripes. And he, he was just not, no, no, no. And I could not convince him to come down with me um, to that depth to, to photograph it. Um, so I was left with only one option. Uh, I, I went back, it was already getting quite late in the afternoon, but I was just really perturbed that he wasn't believing me. And I knew I'd seen the tiger stripes. So I went for another 70 meter dive at the end of the day um, and I managed to spear one of them, uh, and which is not nice, but sometimes has to happen. And I, I brought it up and now I had about a two hour decompression and it's sitting there in, in my bag. Um, of course, I speared it. Uh, it's not dead, but it's dying. And as it's dying and I'm having my two hours of decompression, um, the stripes start to fade. <laughs> and so by the time that I finally got back on the ship, it looked like the one on the top bit there. It looked 
like the, the Randall eye. And Jerry still shook his head and said, I told you it was narcosis. And that just set me off. So I, I actually wouldn't allow the ship to move. <laughs> but the next day we could go back and I borrowed his camera and I went down and I photographed it. And at that point he was very happy about it and agreed it was something new. And so it was eventually named uh, actually after me. So that's now Hophilatelis Erdman and I. Um, anyway, classic little case there. Uh, this is another one from Raja Empat, Cyrilabris marinda. It's a, uh, um, a fairy wrasse, which we named, uh, you can see it's quite quite excited there because we named it after the uh, the Bupati, kind of like the mayor of Raja Empat and the vice mayor. Um, and we actually had the Indonesian minister of fisheries at the time, Ibu Suzi, a very famous lady, come and, and present this new species to them, uh, which was important to do. They had uh, set aside um, close to 2 million hectares of marine protected areas in Raja Ampat, so good to honor those fellows. And just to point out, they're not all small new species we find. Uh, here's a, a, a snapper that we named after Papua. Um, it's found actually in all of the places that I've just mentioned before. Beautiful animal. Um, and occasionally you got to keep uh, the long-suffering wife happy too. That's a, a beautiful little damselfish that I named after my wife. Um, found from Raja Ampat uh, all the way, actually across to North Sulawesi now as well. And sometimes we have fun with the names. There's a, a dwarf goby that we named Prima Pajama for the pajama stripes on it. Beautiful little animal. Um, and here's one that uh, we named after uh, my dear friend and colleague, Miti Mongdong, probably the foremost marine conservationist uh, in Indonesia. Um, she's worked with me since the late 1990s in Bunaken and then now in Raja Ampat in West Papua. Um, we named this because you can see it, it's got the, the, the blue on the top of the eyes and, and across the brain. So it's a, a blue-brained goby, much like uh, Meti, who spent her whole life focused on marine conservation. And then this one other one from uh, uh, Raja Ampat. This one we named after um, Su Suiviota minorsorum, named after Andrew and Marit Miners from uh, the Misol Eco Resort, the founders of Misol Eco Resort. Um, this actually was one I found just a year and a half ago uh, while at a Misol Fish Geek Week. Um, and I was just swimming along the reef and I, I just was looking for some reason into to sponges and I happened to notice this. And if you blow up on that, so this is again a, a sponge just at down about 20 meters. And there you can see that little guy hanging out there. Um, and it, man, it was a bugger to catch one, let me tell you. But, uh, but it, it turned out it was a brand new species. So we named that one uh, after Andrew and Marit, uh, fittingly so for all the amazing conservation work they've done there. Um, and now I'm gonna to move to the final bit of the bird's head just to, to point this out. Uh, this is a, not a particularly beautiful damsel fish, but uh, we named this Palmacentris bella pictus, which means the war paint damsel uh, for that, that blue paint on the face. And this is the typical shot you're gonna get of this animal. It's very aggressive, comes after you immediately, um, just, just right out and, and chasing you around. The interesting thing about this one is that it's up in only one and a half to two meters of water. And the only place we know on the whole of the planet that it's found is right there uh, on the north bit of Fak Fak at a place called Cocos. Um, this is what we would call a microendemic. It's probably one of the um, absolutely smallest known ranges of a marine species uh, that I can think of. And it seems to be because it's located in an area that's a huge mangrove swamp there. And there's just this little patch of coral in the middle of the mangrove swamp. Um, and so it seems that it's very isolated and it's allowed a number of new species to, uh, to evolve there. And that war paint damselfish is one. Um, here's another one we found on that same set of uh, reefs in the middle of the muddy mangroves. Um, this one, uh, a, a blenny, a coral blenny named after Vic Springer, who's a Smithsonian scientist who spent his life studying these. Um, and you can see again, it, it's quite close to one which you'll see all around Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Ixini's bicolor, but the one there is a slightly different coloration. And again, only found in that little tiny area. Um, and then here's Eviota gunawanai, another one of my um, very close Indonesian female marine conservation colleagues. Uh, again, also from that very small area of, of Fak Fak, a beautiful little dwarf goby. So those are my new species uh, that I thought I would share. Um, I don't know, Michael and Alex, do, do you want to have some uh, Questions or anything, or should I carry on with some behind uh, the scenes? Question is. I just checked. You go ahead. Yeah, um, that's a tremendous amount of new new discovery. I mean, how many years span have you spent in a, been doing this in, in that in that part of the world in the Rajampat uh, in the peninsula? 
So um, I moved to Indonesia in 1991, 92 um, uh, for my PhD work. Uh, at that time, it was very much focused on uh, stomatopods, on mantis shrimp. Um, and Alex, um, Roy Caldwell was actually my PhD advisor. So um, I spent a lot of time with Roy. Um, That's I, fantastic. <laughs> had dinner with him right before COVID shut us all down. Really? Um, <laughs> oh, wow. And, uh, but uh, um, I started getting into the fish. I mean, I had always enjoyed fish, but uh, I started getting into reef fishes um, at the time that I moved to Conservation International in 2004 uh, and right. started working directly with Jerry Allen. Um, and he quickly told me to forget this invertebrate nonsense. It's time to get into the <laughs> real deal. So, um, I've, I've kind of been moved over into the fish world since that time. Great. Okay, let's move on. Okay. So, um, uh, M Michael asked me to, sh to show a few behind the scenes photos of what it's like to, to be a marine biologist in this part of the world doing this. Um, and that's just showing, you know, about to go on a, on a survey dive. Um, as I said, a lot of the diving I do is deeper, um, frequently in the 50 to 70 meter range. Uh, and when you do that, you always need at least one spare tank, if not a couple. Uh, so it's quite typical to be going with a couple of tanks and a bunch of other gear. Um, and we oftentimes use scooters as well. Um, scooters as well as, of course, cameras and various and other collection gear, including pole spears and nets and so forth. Um, it can get a little bit crowded, as you can see there, <laughs> frequently. <laughs> everything uh you know dangling off of me in different bits and pieces but uh that's that's what you need when you're uh especially if you're going to be down deep um doing some of this work so yeah uh good fun so que question for you i'm surprised that you're not a rebreather diver with how much time you spend at that depth um i i how actually come? i am a rebreather diver as well okay okay um, but i have not yet done the training to uh to be at that those depths so i'm i'm a okay a rebreather diver but uh it's, it's it. on my list and if i can get out of this covid cage um yes. right, right yeah okay neat okay and then i just thought i'd throw in you know i also um have been doing a fair bit of work in the last um seven years or so on shark and ray conservation and especially um quite, quite a bit of telemetry work so satellite tagging acoustic tagging um, that's a, a reef manta in New Caledonia, um, actually just uh, in February of this year, that I had just tagged with a brand new GPS fast lock satellite tag. Um, and we've also done some pretty cool work with fresher sharks. Uh, recently. Wow. Um, I have a that's amazing. <laughs> Indonesian colleague, Rafid Shidki, who's uh, started the Indonesian thresher shark project uh, in, in Alor. And uh, he is now also a master student at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, so he's doing this satellite tagging there. And here we are after we've um, tagged the shark and this is uh, taking it on a recovery swim because it's, it's actually been caught by a fisherman by the tail uh, and, and oh. dragged up for about an hour's battle before it gets to the surface. And uh, wow. we need to actually swim it uh, to kind of recover it. And man, thresher sharks are probably my most favorite animal now. They're just incredible beasts. Look a little bit like a Teletubby, don't they? So. <laughs> <laughs> so, beautiful. The best beast. gray one that never got featured. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Love that. So, gorgeous. Yeah, so um, I think that those are some of the, yeah, that, that, those are the photos really that I guess I wanted to share uh, with you all. Um, and then I think that you maybe had some other questions and things you wanted to discuss. So um, thank you. Um, there was this huge mantis or, uh, ray, or huge rays you discovered in, 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 uh, in Raja Ampat. Remember that? This enormous, enormous thing ray, is it? Yeah, I, I, um, shoot, I, I probably should have uh, showed a photo of that. Um, yeah, so that's a, that is to this day uh, known as the, the world's largest stingray, uh, mm -hmm. but it still doesn't have a name on it. That's the interesting thing. Um, Just so reference how big, really? was, how, big actually, how big actually was it? It was 3.2 meters across and over six meters long from tip of the snout to the, to the end of the tail. So it was wow. Huge, wow. absolutely huge. And um, it was at the, uh, the dive site, well-known dive site in Rajampal called Blue Magic. Um, yeah. And, uh, it was actually, it was, a, it was a New Year's Day dive with my family. Um, I had my 10-year-old son um, taking him for one of his first dives, actually. And uh, oh, wow. not... I was not allowed theoretically to take him below three meters, um, <laughs> and uh, according to my wife. And anyway, we got <laughs> in the water, and it was one of these days where it was just crystal clear. And you look down to the base of the reef slope, and 
I just couldn't believe my eyes. You know, there's this massive, massive stingray laying in the sand. And I'm, you know, I'm up at, at two meters looking down. I'm like, that can't be what it looks like. You know, I'm, I'm quite far from it. it. That really can't be that. And I'm just staring and staring. And I've you know, got my son by the hand and I'm slowly sinking <laughs> towards it. And the, the dive master comes over and he looks at me and he looks down, he looks at me, looks, and he, he's like, oh my God. And then he starts just bolting down to it. I'm like, well, bugger this. Oh. I, I, if I find, I got to get down there. So I just put my son down and uh, he did his first 30 meter dive right there on the top. Oh. Uh, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, I, I wish I could show the photo. It's, it's a spectacular beast. Um, yeah, six wow. meters long. Um, oh. And I immediately shared that photo with uh, uh, Dr. Will, Wright, Will White and Peter Last. Um, CSIRO in, in Tasmania, who were kind of the world's top experts on these rays, and and they they knew it. Interestingly, they they had heard of a ray that size before um, from the Northern Territories in in Australia, caught by a, a prawn trawler, um, and there was a story oh, wow. of having caught one of these, and then it, it spontaneously aborted a pup uh, when it was. They couldn't. It was so big they couldn't actually pull it into the into the the boat. But it, it it aborted its pup in the net, and they were able to get the pup out. And they hung that up and took a photo of it. And the pup alone was already the size of a Mekong giant freshwater stingray. And, Holy uh, and they cow! Threw it away. So they had heard oh. of this, and then they'd never seen anything more. Then now I had photo and video. Um, wow! So I'm very excited. And you know, I said, well, you know. What do, we, what do we do? It's a new species. I mean, you're not going to create yeah. something like that and put it in a bottle, obviously. <laughs> no. So, um, no. So it, actually, it elicited a pretty interesting discussion. In the end, it was agreed that if it was ever possible to simply get a genetic sample uh, from the animal, that would probably be sufficient along with all the photographs to, to name it. Um, and wow. it's been seen now three or four times since that by other dive uh, dive guides and so forth around Blue Magic. So it's definitely a long-lived animal that's around there. And I think it's something we should look for. Michael, we, get to Blue we Magic, need whenever. to go back. <laughs> now I have to see it myself. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. All right, you have something from, uh, what's next for us? I don't know. What? Oh, All it's kinds the silicon. The silicon. Exactly. Yes, we need to oh. see the silicon. <laughs> I think that I, I only threw this into the slideshow, uh, Michael, because you had asked me to talk a bit about Bunaken. Exactly. Uh, my time Definitely. Bunaken. I was just going to say this. My time in Bunaken in North Sulawesi was really defined by this animal uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so this is the Indonesian silicon, and that's a, a picture of my beautiful wife diving with it. Um, so we actually, we were moving to North Sulawesi. Uh, we were staying um, at Murex, your favorite place with Dr. and Mrs. Batuna, the late Dr. Mm -hmm. Batuna. Um, and uh, this was from, during my honeymoon, actually. And uh, we, we drove to the Monado fish market with some friends and got out of a taxi. And there was a coelacanth being wheeled by on a cart. And my wife, who was <sighs> a, 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 quite, quite a natural history buff, said, what the heck is that fish? And uh, I said, oh, it's a coelacan. Um, <laughs> oh. said, well, what is that? And I said, oh, well, you know, it's, it's thought to be the evolutionary missing link between, you know, fishes and, and land animals. And it's kind of a weird thing to see here. And she says, well, sh should, we, should we buy it? Should we take it? And I'm like, oh, come on, it's a two meter long fish. And we're <laughs> on our honeymoon. What are we going to do with this? Um, so at any rate, we took some photographs of it. And um, uh, that was about it. And uh, and then when I finally passed those on actually to my uh, advisor, Roy Caldwell, he said, you idiot, why didn't you, why didn't you just buy it and put it in a freezer? Because uh, it turns out it was quite a big find because they had only been seen previously. In the oh. Oh. So oh, no. It took about a year's worth of, uh, of running around North Sulawesi to fish markets and to villages and speaking with villagers um, before we actually managed to find uh, another coelacanth. And, and this one was brought to my house uh, in 1998, I guess it was, um, July oh, okay. 1998, it was brought on the, on the deck of a ship. It had been in the big shark net overnight, and it was on the deck of the ship for about an hour before it got to my house. And of course, we were extremely excited to find it. Um, and we'd been working with these fishermen for about 10 months at that point. Um, and I noted that it just, it flapped its, its one of its uh, fins a little bit. So it quickly got it into the water and I just towed wow. it around on the reef flat in front of my house at Wanakin, uh to try to revive it. And I 
kind of succeeded in reviving it enough that I could drag it over the, the reef edge and, and uh, with my old Nikonos 5, snap this photograph with my wife with it. Um, it unfortunately passed away right after that. But this is now, that animal is in the Indonesian National Museum in Bogor. And it was quite a big find. Wow. Um, I think I've got some, you know, it, it made the cover of nature. It was a quite a big deal. Yep. And um, what that led to, interestingly enough, was... Um, the ability to then really have a lot of interaction with the dive operators in Bunaken, because of course everyone yeah. was excited about this. Um, so we had a couple of different meetings to talk about it. And over time that actually, believe it or not, led to um, the development of the North Sulawesi Water Sports Association, as well as the uh, Bunaken Concerned Citizens Forum. Um, and so it's interesting that the coelacanth led to that over time. Um, but I think that's, everyone would agree that really is the, the genesis of those two organizations. Um, and that led to really a, a rebirth in the, the management of Bunaka National Park, um, which, uh, yeah, fortunately in the early 2000s, we were able to revise the zonation, get patrol systems going, mm -hmm. and, um, and really get both the communities and the, uh, the dive operators working together to, to protect those reefs. So, um, yeah, a lot, lot of good work there, a lot of fun. Uh, all started because of a stinky old fish. So kind of fun. <laughs> you, were, you, were, you were advised of some, to some Japanese... Uh, trying to do some uh, research work on, on, on the silicon there. How do, you, how do you go? Yeah, so um, the uh, Fukushima Aquamarine Aquarium was, was really keen to try to um, first document the, the living silicon in North Sulawesi. And of course, their, their eventual aim is they were really keen to capture one and, and keep it in, in captivity in their aquarium. Mm -hmm. Um, but they, they, they were good. I mean, they, they fully recognized that could only be done if they could prove that there was a, you know, a reasonably large population of them in North Sulawesi. So they brought their, their little ROV uh, to, to look for coelacanths in North Sulawesi, and they stayed at Murex uh, and did this work. Um, I went out with them a number of times. They also brought uh, rebreather divers to look as well. Um, and the first couple of expeditions, they didn't didn't manage to find any coelacanths, but uh, eventually they struck gold and uh, wow. they got some amazing footage of the coelacanths, actually just in Monado Bay, believe it or not. Right. Um, and then Incredible. they ended up with some rather uh, disturbing photographs that are kind of tell the story about humans. Uh, you know, these, these animals are down at 200 meters depth in a cave and the floor of the cave is of course covered with uh, plastic bags and Ugh. food wrappers and things like that, which is really sad to see. But at any rate, those uh. guys have continued on. They've, they've, um, they've actually managed to film uh, silicants in Biak in West Papua um, and a few other places around North Sulawesi. And, uh, and now they've also been caught in Raja Ampat. So we know that there is an Indonesian silicant population, at least from North Sulawesi to, to West Papua. Wow. Is, what's the diff distinct difference between an Indonesian silicon and African silicon? Is that can you see the difference at all? Um, I should have again put a photo in here, but uh, uh, the, genetically they're separated by about eleven million years of, of evolution. Oh, um, wow! But in terms of their actual uh, morphology and, and so forth, they're they're pretty darn similar. The uh, um, the, the, the most easy to see difference really is in their color pattern. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the Western Indian Ocean ones are much more blue, uh, whereas the ones in, in Sulawesi are uh, a bit more brownish, actually. But it's okay. small differences, to be honest with you. It's really the genetics which sets them apart most, most uh, obviously. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, that is so interesting. Uh, and we've got, we've got whale sharks, right, from Chandrawasi Bay. Uh, well, sure, I can continue on here, I suppose, if I wanted to. Uh, I just point out, <laughs> I, I didn't say that before, but, um, you know, my organization has worked very closely with the West Papua government, with the local governments, communities, and a number of other conservation partners um, over the past 20 years. And we now have this beautiful network of 21 marine protected areas across uh, Raja Ampat, Kaimana, Chendrawasi, uh, totaling about 4.7 million hectares. That's a, an important way to safeguard uh, actually that incredible biodiversity of that region. Um, and what was I going to show you here? Sorry. I was going to show you about whale sharks here. Okay. 
So yeah, the, the, the whale shark aggregations in Chandrawasi are probably the most consistent yet discovered on Earth. So they're there year round. Um, wait a minute, where am I? Sorry, <laughs> here we go. Uh, and they, they do occasionally get caught in the bagans that they come to, uh, to feed around. And um, we managed to do some interesting tagging with, uh, with this, uh, utilizing that fact. So here we're putting on a, um, a, a uh, um, fin mount satellite tag uh, on the, the animals. That's got lithium batteries, which allow us to follow the sharks uh, for about two years, actually, before the, uh, the tag will kind of migrate out of the fin. Um, and you can see there, there's the whale shark happy with its bling. Um, and that allows us to, to get these incredible uh, tracks of where they're moving. Um, that's one, you know, a year and a half long track. Uh, all those dots are different times that it pinged the satellites. And you can see it went up to, to uh, Palau, uh, over into PNG waters, over to to, to North Sul or South Sulawesi, Southeast Sulawesi, uh, and then down into uh, actually even Australian waters. There, um, here's another one uh, that ended up spending about six months. You can see where all the red dots are there uh, in a tidal mud flat uh, off of Marauke in West Papua, um, which is just oh. unheard of. For, so we're really finding some very interesting things about these whale sharks now that we can really track them. You see it, it first it went from Chendrawasi all the way up to Mindanao in the Philippines, then down to Kaimana Triton Bay, uh, and then eventually into this mud flat where it spent six months in water less than two meters deep. Uh, kind of crazy. Wow. wow. Uh, and then there's this one, uh, which uh, probably our most impressive track, 23,000 kilometers in 14 months. Uh, it swam from Chendrawasi all the way out to the Marshall Islands, uh, back, then it went up to the Mariana Trench, and then back to Chendrawasi. So we're getting some really, really interesting wow. uh, kinds of tracks there. So yeah, yeah. good fun. So, wow. That is an incredible amount of space to cover. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah there is. Now with, with COVID-19, um, a lot of uh, uh, probably a lot of uh, divers are not out there. What do you think the impact um, will be to this animal that you know there's no monitoring, no ranger out there? What's your take on the, on this one? Uh, the, the the impact of COVID is that what you were saying? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, so I mean, um, stories about what's happening in Rajampat and and Chandrawasi Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, your thoughts on this? So I think what we've I've now had the opportunity to spend a lot of time talking with the dive operators that are still in Raja, especially. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, initially we were hearing various other quite disturbing reports about the fact that now that there's no tourists on the water, um, that there were a number of uh, fishermen who were uh, not the local communities, but rather um, fishermen from Sorong that were looking at taking advantage of the fact that, uh, that these reefs were kind of unoccupied. Um, and that certainly did happen. Uh, we, we saw a number of the bigger boats from Sorong going down, especially into Misol waters. But fortunately, the, the, um, the resort there maintained its own patrol system, uh, and they were able to um, catch those guys with the water police, the Rajampat water police, and, and basically send them off, uh, confiscating all of their fish, confiscating all of their gear. And so that seems to have basically, the words gotten out that despite the fact there's no tourism, there's still patrols there. Um, in the north of Rajampat, it's a little bit different, but uh, nonetheless, the, the Rajampat MPA Management Authority um, has been sending out uh, patrols now, um, and the, the homestays and the, the resorts are now working closely with them uh, to report any incidents that they see. And it seems that actually there's, although there were some initial uh, reports that sounded like there was uh, bomb fishing and shark finning happening, um, further investigation seems to show that's not necessarily the case. Right. Mostly right. The, there is some fishing by local community members, but they are allowed to fish there. Um, and right. Plus, without without any tourism around, um, they kind of have to. Um, so, right. so we actually feel that right now things are probably in pretty good shape in Rajampat. Um, and if anything, it's brought the the dive community closer together uh, with the communities to really protect those reefs. So um, that, that's, I think, actually overall a positive story. And I've been hearing actually that, um, the, you know, the lack of, the general lack of boats on the water has meant that, uh, that you're seeing, you know, um, a lot of the reef sharks up in very shallow water. You're seeing bigger aggregations of some of the big reef fishes right up on the shallow. So um, I think wow. it's actually looking pretty, pretty interesting there. By comparison, I was just shown a um, drone video yesterday from Komodo National Park um, which showed six big boats um, just repeatedly bombing uh, 
at South Ridge, oh. which was really disturbing to see. But um, wow. I, I immediately thought that that was going to be one of the places where we're really going to have a problem because the it's, yeah. it's not quite the same type level of patrolling going on there. And with, with no tourism happening in, in Komodo, it looks like it's taking a beating right now. And I'm sure that's the case in a lot of places actually. So, yeah. You have, uh, Sorong is still closed at the moment. I mean, do you have any news and when you, do you think if you open up to tourism again? You know, I think that the Indonesian government is largely taking its lead from, from what it sees of, of other governments around the region. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, it's definitely seeming like it's pretty shut. And, and you know, uh, it, I feel actually really horrible for a lot of the, the community members who aren't really getting a good flow of information about this. And they, yeah. I think they're envisioning that COVID is something like, you know, those zombie movies or something. And, and we've heard some really heartbreaking stories of, you know, no villages are allowed to go from one village to the next because they're terrified. And, and so that, that's actually wow. sad to me. But um, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll come out of this relatively soon. I, I certainly mm. hope so. But, uh, mm. Yeah, we'll Mafia book in Indonesia water like Budakans and Rajampat for the last 20, 20, 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a significant change you've seen in, in this last 30 years. Or so. mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, you know, if you ask me what changes I've seen, I would say that, um, and I add, I, I am an optimist by nature. I think you have to be if you work in marine conservation um, because there's so much bad stuff you hear all the time. But um, but, you know, I can say with 100% um, confidence and, and sincerity that, you know, working in, in Bunaken, when I first started working there, there was a big issue with um, uh, a lot of anchoring on the reef tops, um, lots of destruction going on from that. There was still some bombing in the more remote parts of the reef, lots of cyanide fishing, uh, shark finning, etc. And, um, you know, bringing everybody together, all the stakeholders together, we were actually able to see a pretty significant increase in the health of the corals, um, as well as the, the, the number of sharks and turtles and things around. Um, now, that's kind of bounced around, I guess, uh, since the early 2000s. Um, and I, I can't speak that much about it because I'm not there, but, uh, but West Papua, I, I, I have a very strong understanding of how that's gone um, since... 2002 when I first went to Rajampat and um, you know I really have to say it's been very much positive the the when I went there in 2002 um, there was bomb fishing everywhere in, in Rajampat there was shark finning everywhere um, the, the reef fish were still in pretty good shape when you found a reef that hadn't been bombed um, but but uh, because because the local community is just there's not that many they don't really re rely so heavily upon the reefs but uh but the outsiders doing the shark finning and bombing and things were they it was horrific um and and that's really changed i mean we've seen a tremendous increase uh in the the health of the reefs in rajampat overall um of course in 2012 the uh government uh, having been pushed a little bit by some of the dive operators, um, declared Rajampat a shark and ray sanctuary, the only one in Southeast Asia at the time. And, uh, and we've really seen a tremendous increase in the number of reef sharks, especially around Raja um, since that time. Now, more recently, there's been a lot of concern about over-tourism in Raja. And I think without question, it is uh, an issue, uh, you know, loving a place to death, so to speak. But, um, you know, I guess, first of all, I would note that that the Rajampat government now fully recognizes that they made some mistakes there in terms of allowing uh, perhaps a few too many boats and tourists uh, to come in. And actually COVID yeah. is providing the opportunity to rethink that. I, I think here in New Zealand, you're seeing the same thing. There's a lot of discussion in the tourism industry about, hey, let's take this opportunity to rethink. Uh, we were going a little bit too much towards mass tourism and that's not really the direction we want to go. So I, I'm personally hopeful that all around the world, but especially in, in Raja and Indonesia, that there's going to be a, an opportunity from COVID to rethink uh, how we bring tourism back. And it's not going to bounce back super quick, I don't think, um, but it'll come back quickly enough. And so um, we are certainly trying to work with the government right now uh, and the dive operators to, to really think that through and, and um, ensure that we don't get to an over-tourism tourism type of situation, because it's, it's just not nice for anyone. So. But we do want, of course, the communities to be benefiting from uh, from tourism, and, and so that that can be done carefully. Um, I yeah, want to, how do I want to express my sincere thanks, and certainly 
Bunaken and Rajampat is compared to what I've been there in 2002 in the early 90s and in 90s is much better shape right now uh, than ever before. Uh, it's all because of what you have done there, you know, in those areas. But um, what do you think will become of this, this area in 30 years from now? <laughs> Crystal ball. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly not a, uh, someone who can look into the future. But I would only say, again, coming back to the fact that I am an optimist. Um, and, you know, throughout this time that we've been seeing these areas getting better, we've been hearing plenty of stories from other parts of the world where it's all just going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, I certainly remember very much at the 2000 International Coral Reef Symposium in Bali, um, there was a lot of discussion from Australian scientists that there would be no reefs in 2020, that, that, that they were going to be gone, right? Um, and that was based upon, of course, the bleaching that was happening and a number of other things. Um, and I guess what I would say is, you know, we're at 2020 right now. Um, reefs certainly around the world are not in the state that they were 30, 40, 50 years ago, but in some cases they've gotten better. Um, now, without question, uh, we are not doing good things to the ocean right now. Um, but I also think if you really look at the big picture, um, I think we as humans tend to overestimate um, our importance on the planet. Um, and, you know, life on Earth has been subject to much greater forces and stresses than over the course of the, the history of life birth on Earth um, than what we're giving right now. And I'm not saying by any means that we need to stop our focus on trying to, uh, you know, lessen climate change. That, that absolutely has to happen. But to me, it's not a question of will there be reefs or will there be life on Earth in 30 years or 100 years or a million years? Um, they will be there. Um, the question really is what they're going to look like and if they're going to be the same mix of species as we have right now. And are we going to be part of that? Um, because I think there's a decent chance that we will, we will not be part of that. And I think <laughs> we need to be taking a look at ourselves more than anything. But I would say, you know, reefs have been around in one form or another for about two billion years. Um, uh, now, that wasn't coral reefs originally, you know, they were, they were stromatolites and algal-based reefs, and then they became bryozoan reefs and sponge reefs and bivalve reefs and whatever, and, and then we didn't really get to the corals until about 240 million years ago, um, but still 240 million years ago, and they've been going ever since, and they've made it past a number of major mass extinctions. Um, there will be more extinctions without question, and it is happening. Um, but I also think that we sometimes underestimate how resilient life is on this planet. Um, you know, if you read textbooks about what corals can survive, it, it typically, you know, it's, it's a very narrow range that we hear about. We hear about how sensitive they are. And that is true in some places. But um, Michael, I know that you've certainly in your travels around uh, Eastern Indonesia, I know you've seen some of the things that I've seen, which are corals growing in the most ridiculous places, growing in rivers, growing in mud banks, growing in areas where you know, some of the, the bays in Rajampat go to 36 degrees Celsius every single day. They, they heat up to that temperature and yet they have live corals growing there. So we know that life can adapt. Uh, to all this uh, that we're throwing at it. Um, it's a question of how long it takes. And of course, what we're seeing right now is that uh, it, it doesn't adapt quickly. So we are seeing, you know, mass death. But I, I personally have a longer term optimistic view. Uh, I think what we really need to worry about is, is whether we're going to be part of that. Um, exactly, that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, got any question? I think we take one question. I, I have a question from, from Jen Hayes, actually. Yes, go ahead. Jen, Jen Hayes wants to know, um, how about next-gen Indonesian marine scientists? Are there a few in the pipeline? Absolutely. Now, um, thank you for that, Jen, and I really appreciate your and David's focus on next-gen. Um, uh, I think that's super important at this point. Uh, as you get get on towards 40s and your late 40s and 50s, you realize how important that is. Um, and certainly for me, uh, that's a really important part of my work is focusing energy on that. Um, right now, I actually have a number of Indonesian masters and PhD students that I'm, uh, that I'm busy uh, advising, including some here in University of Auckland. Uh, wow. I'm about to go to Murdoch University in Australia. Um, and just working with a number of others. I mentioned Rafid, uh, the thresher shark man, mm -hmm. uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. So yes, we have actually uh, the brightest young 
Indonesian marine scientists I've seen in 30 years are, are out there and about right now. Um, and they're, they're, um, they're really doing some incredible work. I mean, they've far surpassed me uh, without question. And so we're really happy to be doing what we can to help them along. Um, and then in terms of marine conservation, you know, I think there's more awareness right now in Indonesia uh, that, than I've ever seen in the 30 years that I've been uh, associated with Indonesia. Uh, lots of young people that are very focused on these issues. And uh, so I, again, I, I remain an optimist, absolutely. Well, that is well, great to hear. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for what you do for us. And thank you for taking time to talk to us. And uh, hope to see you on the other side. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers.